Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 90 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Wayne's World, Wayne's World, World, Party Time, time. Excellent. Excellent. Woo, 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 woo. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. Wayne's World. Indeed, Wayne's World. We are getting ever closer to episode number 100, and we are really excited, and we really, really, really want to celebrate with all of our listeners. If you've been listening over the past few weeks, or if you have been on our Patreon page, then you know we have put out a call for audio files from all of you. We want to hear from you about your favorite things of Pop Culture Deprived, things we've talked about that you've liked, things that we've talked about that you've hated, things that we got wrong, things that you've shouted at us for. Um, we just want to hear what you have or haven't enjoyed. Your comments on the last, well, at this point, 90 episodes, but or the, the episodes up to episode 100. What you think of the show, what you think of us. I don't, don't tell me what you think of me. <laughs> but please tell me what you do think of me. <laughs> You can send these to us through email at uh, podcast at eloquentgushing.com. You can uh, leave us a voicemail at uh, speakpipe.com slash eloquentgushing. If you are shy and don't want your voice on the show, you can send us text and we will read it for you, though we are really hoping that we get to hear your beautiful voices. Mm. You don't listen to My Brother, My Brother and Me, do you? I do not. Okay. They, so so My Brother, My Brother and Me have just um, hit episode 420. Wow. Um, and there was this whole thing of like, they're going to do something big for 420. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's the culture they're in. Um, and Justin McElroy talked about when he hosted the Joystick podcast, which is where I know him from. So that's like a 2009, 2010 podcast, something like that. Um, and when they were approaching episode 100 and they couldn't find the time, I think is a nice way of putting it, to uh, plan episode 100. So they released like episode 97, episode 97.5, episode 97.75, 98, (laughs) 98.25, 99, 99.1, 99.2. And they just kept doing it. And then I think they just went to like 101. (laughs) Oh. So we're trying ahead of times, but I can also see the like appeal of going, yeah, you missed it. It's on the secret feed. Right, right. Yeah. (laughs) And and for the record, they did skip episode 420. Oh, did they? Oh. <laughs> Which, given that their celebration for episode like 400 was them on the red carpet for, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. The dude who did Margaritaville. Jimmy Buffett. Them on the red carpet for Jimmy Buffett's new Broadway show, interviewing people. And oh. like, basically, it's just a stream of consciousness of them being freaked out having to interview people. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was very strange. All right. Anyway, Wayne's World. So we are actually trying to plan ahead. So we have given you ample notice of when we need your audio by. So please, if you would like to be included in our 100th episode, have us your bit by November 28th, 2018, in case you're listening in the future. (laughs) That's my joke. It is, but I was talking, so I got to steal it. Is it party time now? No way. Excellent. (sighs) You were supposed to say way. Way. <laughs> it was most triumphant. No, oh, wrong sure. movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect this is going to be a similar answer to when we talked about Bill and Ted, but how come you've never seen Wayne's World? Ugh, stupid humor, dude. Hmm? Plus, honestly, I never watched SNL growing up, so I wasn't in that core group of people who just went crazy about SNL. Okay, that's fair. Because, yeah, stupid humor. Yeah, I didn't watch it either, but that's because it's not really aired over here. Really? Yeah, we. I think there are some places you can get it. And I think even, like, the Wayne's World sketches were edited into a, like, short episode once. Okay. Of something else, but, yeah. Um, I imagine everyone who's listening to this knows this, because it's a fairly famous film. I, I mean, did you know about Wayne's World? Oh yeah, this this yeah. isn't one that you'd never heard of or anything. Correct. I mean, Wayne and Garth are iconic. Just okay. just looking at them, it's iconic. Okay, 
So most of you know this, but Wayne's World is a 1992 comedy starring Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. It was directed by Penelope Spheris and also features Tia Carrera and Rob Lowe. It was based on a series of sketches from Saturday Night Live, the second movie based on something from the show after the Blues Brothers in 1980. The film was a major success. It earned $183 million on a $20 million budget. The film has had a major legacy on pop culture, popularising the phrases, that's what she said, we are not worthy, and not, as well as returning Bohemian Rhapsody to number one after its use in the film. And for the very tiny percentage of you who do not know what Wayne's World is about, according to IMDb, two slacker friends try to promote their public access cable show. And as usual, that's pretty lacking. Yeah. I mean... they're not. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's like the first maybe five minutes mm. when Wayne says that he would love to make a living doing this thing, but he knows he can't. But he's also not doing anything to promote it. Right. It is just popular amongst the, the slack, slacker, in inverted comma, kids. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it is about their public access cable show and mm. selling out to the man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How were you able to watch this one? It is unfortunately only available to rent here in the US. Okay. On Amazon. Probably Vudu and other places too, but I only ever look on Amazon. <laughs> okay. Um, over here, it is on Sky Cinema. I also own this in a two disc set with the sequel. Of course you do. Mm. Um, what's your experience of Mike Myers and Dana Carvey? Um, I have no experience with Dana Carvey other than recognizing his face, largely because he's Garth. <laughs> okay. Um, Mike Myers, a little more so. I, I found Mike Myers through Austin Powers in high school, which I loved. Austin. Well, I loved the first one. The second one was okay, and then I didn't watch any more after that. Right. Um, and he voices Shrek, but I've only seen the first one of those. Okay. That's about it. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Great great to a lesser extent on some of his films. Um, uh, I could ask about your experience of similar material, but the only thing that's coming to mind is Bill and Ted. <laughs> a Night at the Roxbury. Yeah. Just fair. because it's an SNL-based mm. thing. I've seen that. I loved that in high school. I don't okay. know why, but I did. Okay. I have not seen Night at the Roxbury. I don't think it holds up. But it was awesome back then. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it would. I'm just having a quick look at the list of other films they've done. I've only seen Coneheads, Wayne's World 2 and Blues Brothers 2000. Which. Hmm. Yeah, I think A Night at the Roxbury was the only other one I'd seen. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did you enjoy Wayne's World? I'm going to shock everybody and say yes. Yeah? I did. It was delightful. But where we've talked about a couple of films recently and you've been like, I loved this. Uh, can you give me a rating of a scale, some sort of indication of how much you liked this? Well, that's not easy to do. <laughs> um, I didn't like it as much as Star Trek 3 because I well, absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> loved Star Trek 3. <laughs> um, it's very similar. You know what? I'll say it's pretty on par with Bill and Ted 2. Okay. Because I... I loved Bill and Ted, and I really, really liked Bill and Ted too. So this one is is not not quite love, but I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, is that helpful? Mm. Did can you ex explain a bit more what you liked about it? Is it characters? Is it the comedy? Is it the intricately woven plot? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I. Uh... It was funny. It was really, really funny. I mean, there were a few bits that we'll talk about when we get to does this movie hold up that were not great. But overall, it was really funny. And it tr <laughs> it was really, really self-aware without trying to be self-aware, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because it, just, it had some really lovely moments like Garth saying that he's not ready for love because he needs to be comfortable with himself first. You know, and it just did little things like that all the way through that, that are unexpected, but it's done in such a way that it's completely serious and not like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay. And combining those two things together just warmed the cockles of my cold, dead heart, and I loved it. <laughs> I, I think very much like Bill and Ted, the charm of the two main characters goes a very long way. 
Yes. It's it's difficult not to like them. I agreed. Um, I was surprised at how much I liked them. Mm-hmm. I think I expected... At the very least, I expected Wayne to be a jerk. Right. I don't know why, but that's what I was expecting going into it, and that's not the case at all. And I was very pleasantly surprised. I mean, all of the things that they did that were inappropriate slash misogynistic slash just jerky were all things that weren't considered that way in 1992. Yeah. And so they weren't doing anything on purpose. They were just... Well, mm, for the most part. Mm, maybe we'll look back part. to that. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just... It, it was fun. It was good fun. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised I did like it as much as I did, but I was absolutely delighted by it. Okay. Yeah, I think Wayne is not as charming as Bill and Ted. Because he is a little prickly and uh, much more self-interested at times. Well, they're also older. True. I mean, Bill and Ted are very <laughs> obviously teenagers. Even yeah, in, even in the second one, thing, they're they? still yeah. teenagers. And Wayne and Garth are obviously of an indeterminate age. And they do that <laughs> on purpose. But it's still very, very juvenile. They still... they act like teenagers they talk like teenagers they still live with their parents i mean garth is still sleeping in a bedroom in his parents house in a twin bed with posters on the wall you know (laughs) it but you can tell they're older and so it it lends a slight creepier vibe to it i think and and so you get an unsettled sense instead of that charming sense that you get from bill and ted yeah yeah it's funny but mike myers is the one that i think looks older in this like, he looks like he's in his 30s. <laughs> Dana Carvey's got, like, eight years on him. <laughs> okay. I think he was something like 37 when he filmed this, which... Oh, weird. It, sh- it shows it a couple of times. I th- I feel like Dana Carvey's face looks older, but he hides so well behind the glasses and the hair that he yeah, gets away true. with it. Mm. 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 So let's just go ahead and get the elephant out of the room. Does this movie mm. hold up now? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> well, why don't I tell you what Tia Carrera thinks and then what some of our listeners think and then I'll tell you what I think. Yes, please. Okay. So uh, in an interview in 2017, Tia Carrera says, if you have a sense of humor, the movie is great. If you're on the 2017 PC patrol, it might not be. And I think that's pretty spot on, honestly. Um, I mean... I, I will utterly agree with her. There is some hilarious stuff in this. Mm-hmm. This is a very funny film, which takes it very far. There is stuff in this mm-hmm. that I think even in 1992, them holding up a picture of a model and just spending a couple of minutes talking about how beautiful she is. Hey, tentpole. Yeah, I I, then, I forgot that was in there. I, 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 know, I know Mike Myers is not saying... He wants to own Tia Carrera in the same way he own he wants to own the guitar. But at the same time, he is making the same joke about owning a thing. She will be mine. Oh, yes. She will be mine. Yeah, I made a note of that. You know, she will be mine. But um, I think I can give that one a pass because it was 1992. And in 1992, that was almost considered romantic oh, this is this is such a fine line to walk i think looking at this through the lens of 2018 versus mm. 1992 because now i mean i made a note about it my, my first reaction was ugh she's not yeah. property wow this is this is really hard to talk about just because nobody thought it doesn't mean it wasn't right um but it was so commonplace back then that nobody really thought that it was yeah, inappropriate it yeah. to say things like that and i think it was intended to be he wants to be with her, not he's ogling her as a thing, but he really wants to be with her. It was different. It was presented differently than, say, the photo of, was it Christy Brinkley, uh, the Claudia model? Schiffer. Claudia Schiffer. So yeah. that one was very much an objectification. And they presented his reaction to Cassandra slightly differently now, today, we can look at those two things and say they're the same because he's treating them both like objects. But I think they were trying to make a distinct difference. Yeah. 
distinct difference while that's redundant. Yeah, it's 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 one of those situations where I think if you're looking for it, you can see it. So I know, I'd like I say, I know Mike Myers is not saying I want to own her like property, but also the joke is saying that. Right. Um, and there's, there's, you know, smaller moments, the thing like, oh, you know, you're in the forest with Heather Locklear and it's warm, calm down, as a thing. <laughs> and the objectification of the girl, the dream girl. Um, but then you get into like the ex-girlfriend who they just keep going, are you mental? I lost you two months ago. Are you mental? We broke up. Get the net. Like, clearly, this girl actually has some issues. Yes. And I'm not sure it's as funny now as it once was. No, honestly, I think the entire movie would have been better without her. Mm. Honestly, she served no purpose other than to make us laugh at her. Yeah. So I think that is definitely something that could have been removed without impacting the overall story at all. Yeah. So I think I, I will absolutely agree. This is a really funny film. I just found watching it now, every 10, 15 minutes, there was just like, a, oh, okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I think I just got to the point where I enjoyed the parts that I laughed at so much that it was easier to gloss over the rest hmm. and just kind of give it a pass for being 1992. Yeah. I think, um, no, sorry, go ahead. And And... I, I wonder if part of that is my familiarity with this film. Like, this is a film I have seen a lot over the years because it is a very funny film. Um, the, the the sequence in the car with the Bohemian Rhapsody, which is really early in the film, but is one of the most famous comedy sequences from the 90s. Like, mm-hmm. them headbanging in the car is stupid famous. Um, and, and I have done that for years, ever since seeing this film. I've done it. Oh, definitely driving to the cinema with friends on a birthday once. I've done it at clubs when Bohemian Rhapsody came on. Like, it just became a thing to do. Right. But you watch it now and, and trying to be a little bit more uh, stepping back from my familiarity with it. It is hysterical. It is really <laughs> funny. The way they build up to it, they use the song in different ways. Um, and you think the guy is saying, like, let me go because I want to get out and hurl. Right. But actually, no, He even he's getting into it because it is such a, a great song. And then they start headbanging. Mm-hmm. And it's hilarious. And it's really well done. Especially when you watch out for Wayne who cannot headbang. <laughs> which yes. is just the best. Like, I... Mike Myers does not know how to move his neck, clearly. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that the first time around when I was watching it because I was, one, I was marveling that this scene happened so early in the movie because it is mm. also iconic. Even I have seen this scene before mm. and I knew it was in the movie somewhere. I just didn't expect it to be right away. And then I was reading some uh, interviews and some articles because the 25th anniversary happened a little while ago Mm -hmm. and apparently that scene mike myers didn't want to do like he wanted the like the song in there he didn't want the head banging in there he didn't think it was funny and it hurt (laughs) he couldn't do it and it hurt and he was so angry at the director um but i think it it worked out in everybody's favor that it made it into the movie yeah, it is a very, very famous bit of comedy. And and it deserves that. It is very good. And there, there's other stuff throughout here that I think we'll probably come to mm-hmm. that is just wonderful. I just... Uh, and then you get into the whole thing with the police doing the body cavity searches. So it's funny. Which I don't know that it is anymore. I laughed. Does that make me bad? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're awful. I'm going to hang up. Done. <laughs> Yeah, it was ugh, it, that piece was bad. There was also some gay panic in the movie. Oh, oh really? Um, I mean, they paid it off pretty well at the end, where he was finally like, I think it was Russell was like, "I've learned that I can have platonic adult friendships with oh, men." Oh, the blah. "I love you" thing. Yeah, 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 the "I love you" thing with with yeah, both Wayne and Garth. There was very much some gay panic there, mm. um, which was disappointing. But I like that they kept doing the bit until it paid off with Russell at the end. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I suppose, uh, like with the body cavity search stuff, it's not even necessarily that it's stuff you'd call out and go like, no, you can't do that anymore. It's wrong. Uh, It's just not necessarily that funny. And the other bit that comes to mind is where he's like, Who wants Chinese takeout? I know a great place. I'll have the cream of some young guy. (laughs) What a manly. Play it cool. 
<laughs> okay, I laughed. I did. I Which laughed. And I said, oh my works. God, I can't believe they did that. But I laughed. Yeah. yeah. It works if you're 12. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which I think is the target audience for this movie. Yeah. I, did I you, think I would agree. Did you know that line was improvised and was not in the script? No. And apparently they had a really hard time editing out the crew laughing because nobody expected it. Okay. The things you learn. When I'm you... not sure I believe that. <laughs> really? Because Tia Carrera's reaction is so good. Okay. With him laughing and her being like, oh no, stop. <laughs> mm. I don't know. I, w- I, I wonder f- if it was improvised and then they added it. Maybe. I don't know. I think a lot of it was improvised, though, because that's the. This was the first like film set that Mike Myers and Dana Carvey had been on, and they were used to sketch comedy, like SNL, where mm. they could do the improv stuff. I mean, it's scripted, but there's still room yeah. for for yeah. adaptation. Okay, I have a question for you. Okay. When they do the whole um, green screen, blue screen, going around to different cities around the world thing. Mm-hmm. And again, they're like, we're in Hawaii. Hey, do you want to blow me? Uh, um, but the, fu- the, the, the final joke of that, which is a very good joke, is you could be in Delaware. Or imagine being able to be magically whisked away to Delaware. Hi, I'm in Delaware. Is that a thing? Because I know nothing about Delaware because it's such a random American city. Is, is there like a, a further joke there that I'm not picking up on? No, I don't think so. I think it's just because Delaware is so mundane and there's nothing spectacular about it. Okay. That would be the appropriate reaction today. Ah. Uh, Listeners from the Delaware area, tell us what's spectacular about your city. I want to know. A state. Is it a state? Delaware is a state. Is it? It is. Oh, good. So I have a really funny story to tell you. Go on. I had previously seen the product placement bit with Mike Myers and and Dana Carvey and the Pizza Hut and the Reebok and the Pepsi, but I had mm. seen it is- isolated, like just that bit. Okay. And I had no idea it was actually from the movie. I thought it was created with those characters to be like an actual commercial type thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when it showed up in the movie... I could not stop laughing. Nice. Yeah. It's a very good way to do your product placement. It is a very good way to do it. And interestingly enough, it made me get up and get a bag of Doritos off my refrigerator and start eating them. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, you keep Doritos in the fridge? On top of the fridge. Was it because they were spicy hot? (laughs) They were not in the fridge. (laughs) I do not have enough counter or cabinet space, so I have to utilize okay. the flat surface on top of my refrigerator to store things. Um, yeah, because other films that do product placement, because they try to be cool about it, it's usually really obvious and annoying. Like, yes. Hey, everyone in the MCU drives an Audi now. <laughs> um, yeah. And like, oh, they're holding that beer very cleverly. And everyone in Grey's Anatomy uses a Microsoft Surface. <laughs> <laughs> I think the last one I watched there was a bit like someone swept it off a table in annoyance and then picked it up and was like wow it's not broken oh, cool. wow <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've quite noticed that level yeah. it might have been Doctor Strange now I think about it it was definitely a hospital thing okay um, but yeah they are really obvious with their Microsoft stuff in Grey's Anatomy and in fact in most uh, is that CBS NBC Whoever ABC. Does ABC it's ABC yeah they they do a lot of Microsoft advertising. Um, but just having it as we are going to have some very blatant Pepsi stuff in the middle of this. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, no, it was all great. The down to the like the medicine. I've never heard of that particular brand of medicine, but No, same, actually. I particularly liked <laughs> Garth's entire outfit from Reebok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just I think it worked as as a gag as a an indictment on product placement in a movie mm. and it it just made me laugh but yeah yeah it made me laugh even more that I thought that it was an actual commercial like I think I assumed <laughs> that the same parent company owned all of those things and that's why they had done that okay I I don't know which I could see PepsiCo no cause they don't own Reebok do they 
I can see them owning Doritos, but I'm not sure that's true. Hmm. Um, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Do we want to talk about the plot at all? There's a plot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if we were going to use our protagonist goal, antagonist goal thing, our PGAG, um, our antagonist wants to make money. Yes. And Any way possible. To, uh, exploit their show. Exploit the feeble public access show. Right, but I don't think his goal is exploitation, though. His goal is money, and so he is mm. going to do that in any way he can, and he sees this as an easy target. Yeah. And I think Wayne and, well, Garth doesn't really have a goal, but Wayne's goal is to sort of make a living doing Wayne's World. Hmm. Which this seems to be the way to do it. Certainly allows him to buy his guitar and a CD player and the strawberry lace for the car. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Now, by the end of the film, I don't think those stories get resolved. <laughs> no. He's still in breach of contract and Rob Lowe still owns the uh, show. I think it ends up being more of a personal growth story Okay. by the end. That's what it evolves into. Because you get Wayne, he doesn't give up the, the show because he feels like he's selling out. He gives it up, one, because he's pissed off um, that he has to do something that he doesn't want to do. And then two, because he's jealous of Cassandra yeah. and Benjamin. You know, and so it, it was never he's giving it up because he's got these grand ideals and he's trying to stick to his principles. Um, and so by the end, him coming back to Cassandra and wanting to redo the show and use that to help her, I think, is personal growth for him. Okay. But I could be seeing things where there is nothing to be seen. Yeah, because it feels like there is another 10 minutes to be had about Okay, but what happens with the show? What happens next? Well, is that not what Wayne's World 2 is about? Uh, no. Bummer. I'm not sure it ever actually gets resolved. Think about it. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the plot is, is not necessarily there to support sketches like we had with Monty Python. There is a little bit more being hung off it. Um... But it is largely irrelevant to the overall doing fun stuff with music and people who are into heavy metal. I'm sorry, Cassandra's band is not heavy metal. Mm, they're at least rock. They are rock, but not yeah. metal. And, like, they have a lead singer who looks like Tia Carrera. So, again, in 1992, a lot of places would have been very ready to have them on the lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I feel like the goal of this movie was just to make people laugh. Yeah, it, it, it succeeds as a comedy. Like I say, over everything else, this is a very funny film. Yes. It has some very good stuff in it. So we had a comment from Jan at JLMO on Twitter. Actually, it's not JLMO, as I learned when she was on the show a few weeks back. It's at JLMO. And she said, I feel yeah, like... but if you say JLMO... <laughs> kind of alphabetic it is it sounds so lovely but that's not how it's pronounced <laughs> i say sabotage <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough anyway jan said um i feel like two movies shaped the language of teenagers in the 90s wayne's world and clueless and matthew you replied back to her and asked if Actually, how exactly did you ask it? You said... I, I asked, was either of them more impactful on language than Buffy the TV show? Because I, I think that has a lot of impact in the the uh, the cadence of language, not necessarily the actual lingo. Right, right. Mm. And we had two responses to that. Um, Jan's mm. husband, Paul, weighed in, and he said yes with a question mark. It did not elaborate. <laughs> yes? Yeah. <Hey? laughs> 
<laughs> and and then um, Brianna at Buffra said, I'm going to say yes, because both of them were more broadly embraced. Buffy on TV was more niche. And so while it did have impact and still does, the others had more. And I think that's a very logical way to look at it. Okay. The only thing I can think of from Clueless is the as if. And and that I can only think of being used elsewhere like once. Okay. No, as if was definitely a part of my vernacular mm. when I was in high school. But by comparison, we're not worthy is just used everywhere. Like right. I have seen Stadia do that to like people who've won competitions and so on. Right. Um, we also got a response from Jen at IU Girl Jen, and she said, mm. I definitely quote both movies still even more when I was a teen. And she used the we're not worthy gif. Okay. So yeah. I, I think that supports your thesis statement there. Mm. Um, on, on the we not worth, we're not worthy thing, Alice Cooper's amazing in this. Okay. No? <laughs> I don't know anything about Alice Cooper. I was shocked to find out Alice Cooper was an old person doing heavy metal. <laughs> Please don't at me. Oh, he speaks highly of you. (laughs) I just don't know any... I I don't listen to this genre of music, and so... He was was 42 when they made this. No, 44, sorry. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) I I know a lot more about Alice Cooper Neal than I did then. Uh Um, He's one of Catherine's favorite artists growing up, and we actually went to see him last year. Um... Still doing the same big stage show stuff, still with, you know, all sorts of animals and costumes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, the stage show bit is very cool. Feed My Frankenstein is a great song. But then the whole sequence is great. Like, it, to bring it back to the We're Not Worthy, I love that they go, we're not worthy, and he just holds out his hand to be kissed. Yeah. I, I that think is the that, best response. Yeah. I think that bit was improvised. They were trying to break him, and he okay. didn't break. Um, I saw something where he was talking about they thought they could break my iron will, but they couldn't. I Yeah, I can see that. And I thought that was pretty great. I did notice that he held out his hand. Um, yeah. And I thought it just, it, it went along so well with the absolute randomness of them suddenly talking about Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah. So that whole thing where you expect this to be drugs and rock and roll and drummers and sharks um, to use a popular story. TV's out of the window, that kind of thing. But it's actually... So, do you come to Milwaukee often? Well, I'm a regular visitor here. But Milwaukee has certainly had its share of visitors. The French missionaries and explorers were coming here as early as the late 1600s to trade with the Native Americans. In fact, isn't Milwaukee an Indian name? Yes, Pete, it is. Actually, it's pronounced Miliwake, which is Algonquin for the good land. I was not aware of that. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we got a nice little history lesson instead. It's amazing. It's so random. And then Wayne and Garth clearly do not know how to process. They're like, these guys know how to party or what? Right. <laughs> it was such a random moment in the movie, but it yeah. added to the charm for sure. It's great. I, I I love it. I think that's exactly what I want from a cameo of that ilk. For them to come on and be something other than you would expect them to be. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, and he walked around with a swagger stick. Following on from last week's swagger stick. I did not notice. I think it's actually a riding crop, but he basically uses it in that form. Okay. Mm. What else? What did you like about this? What were your favorite things? So much. Because I really did like this movie. I think Garth is adorable. Like, There's nothing not adorable about him. Okay. Oh, you don't seem to agree. Uh... See, I don't know. I just think there's not much to him, certainly in this film. But there is. There is. He's so he's so shy, but still very passionate. Like, he doesn't want to touch people, which I think is hilarious. But I totally get it. But then he comes out with lines like, I have to be comfortable with myself. You know? <laughs> I mean, he had the one bad line where he was like, women just want you to come and get them. Like, oh. Why did you have to say that, Garth? <laughs> That's a little bit skeezy. 
But his every time he started daydreaming about the girl he had a crush on, and he would just like fall off the chair. <laughs> yeah. That he actually falls off the chair. It's not even just a hallucination. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. And um, his line... Did you ever find Bugs Bunny attractive when he'd put on a dress and play a girl bunny? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so random and so bizarre. And I don't know. I just thought he was adorable. Um, you remember last week I told you about the funny line from Red Dwarf? Yes. There's a sequence in the episode of Red Dwarf where they're watching the Flintstones. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about whether they like um, Wilma or not. And, okay. and their feelings towards Wilma. And they they both think she's amazing and wonderful and they'd love a woman like Wilma. And they say, what, what about Betty? Well, I'd go with Betty, but I'd be thinking of Wilma. <laughs> and it's exactly that sort of thing. <laughs> Those random conversations you have at 2am. Yes. Yeah, love it. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like the jelly donut monster fight that he puts on. Okay. I, I like that he drank the jelly out of a donut with a straw. Yeah. It, it's just so random in the middle of this film. It, mm-hmm. it feels like it doesn't fit, but it is very cute. It is. Mm. And then he plays the drums, which is totally unexpected because he's so, like, meek. Almost. Okay. And then he gets up there and just rocks out on those drums, which I really liked. Oh, yeah. No, that's a drummer through and through. They like to have something between them and everyone else, but they can do what they want in their own little cage. Yeah. No, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Perfect sense. Um, I also really loved all of the references to 90s commercials that I used to love. Okay. Um, You got the actual Chia Pet commercial. Ch-ch-ch-chia. <laughs> I loved it. It's so funny. And then you had, um, they pulled up next to the older gentleman sitting in the back of the car and rolled down the window. And they actually asked him, pardon me, do you have any Grey Poupon? That was amazing. Did you okay, have those commercials over there? Well, well that's my, my question. Is that, I have always assumed I just didn't get that joke. That's some sort of, it's funny that he said poop or something. No, 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 no. Oh, there's a whole series of Grey Poupon commercials that were people who were like very posh and they would like somehow run out of, of mustard somehow. And so they would okay. stop and ask other posh people in a car, like in the middle of nowhere, they would just like ask them to roll down their window and then they would say, pardon me, do you have any Grey Poupon? Okay. It worked. I don't know why. I mean, it, it's did. a generation of people who loved Grey Poupon because of these commercials. Right. And, and so that reference delighted me to no end i was laughing so hard clapping my hands i loved it okay it's very nostalgic nice um which reminds me we had a comment from uh, our friend kate at kate met on twitter and she said that she didn't expect me to love this movie but it's nostalgia is strong and it is definitely strong even not being nostalgic about the movie itself but having nostalgia about some of the things in the movie it worked yeah, I think I saw a comment from Josie, the same sort of thing about it, it can't look past her feelings about it from when she watched it, having mm-hmm. originally enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's part of it. Like, I look at this now and I think, oh, I'm, I'm not sure it does work, but I'm not sure it's easy to really articulate and get into why. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. I also really loved that Wayne learned Cantonese for Cassandra. Mm. Like Th- that is very nice. Yeah. It is very nice because so first my cynical heart thought, "Oh god, does he think she's Chinese and she's not?" Like is he learning <laughs> the wrong because he had previously made a kung yeah, fu joke yeah. and then kind of like stepped back with this look on his face like, "Oh, I shouldn't have said that." You know, and so that's where my brain went and then I was like, "Oh god, this is going to go so badly." And then that is actually her language. And that was so delightful. And then having it be, he's like, talk slowly. I'm just learning. And then they have this whole, like, deeply philosophical conversation in Cantonese. Yeah. That is probably one of the best jokes in it. And it's uh, almost because they don't laugh at themselves doing it. It is, mm-hmm. they say one or two syllables, and then you get a whole sequence of subtitles, and they sit there in silence while the conversation plays out. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's very good. And then they just move on from that. Whereas a lot of the other jokes, they're kind of a little bit self-congratulatory about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I also really liked that. That's the sequence where Wayne calls Stacy a psycho hose beast. Mm-hmm. And while that was played for laughs, obviously, Cassandra's character comes back and says, you know, labels don't do anything for anybody and mm. like kind of calls him out on saying that thing, yep. which of course led into other jokes about labels negating people and, and all that stuff. But I thought it was a really nicely done sequence. Yeah. W- was it Kierkegaard or oh, who yeah. was it? Someone from pop culture, Mr. Rogers or someone? <laughs> it wasn't Mr. Rogers. It was somebody whose name was only vaguely familiar to me. Okay. But uh, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Even even if you don't know who those are, you get the difference between classic philosopher and modern pop culture dude. Yes. Mm. But yeah, that is a very nice touch and not something you... Uh, I'm about to say not something you often see, but I feel like it is a little bit of a rom-com trope, trying to learn the language of the cute foreign girl. I'm thinking Colin Firth in Love, actually. Yeah, but that one... That it worked better in Wayne's World than it did in Love Actually, right? <laughs> because There's in Love a lot Actually, of Wayne's World that works better than Love Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least he actually learned her language here, and in Love Actually, he didn't bother for so long. Mm. So yeah, I am also going to admit here that sometimes I have the sense of humor of a twelve-year-old boy because I really liked the Asphinter say what joke. I'd have to say. Asphinter says what? What? I know you didn't, but I oh, did. Mandy. I did. I can't help it. <laughs> I did. And then uh, following along right with that, Wayne's alteration of the note cards yeah. cracked me up. Yes, that that is the joke I would expect them to make. And it, and it lands pretty well. But the actual sort of playground joke being in this, you know, big Hollywood film. I like you, it. you expect more. <laughs> I don't think I ever expect more from Mike Myers. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that is the other side of this thing. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. <laughs> um, oh, what else did I really, really like? Oh, um, oh, what's his name? Is it Robert yes. Patrick? It is. Robert Patrick's cameo was amazing and completely unexpected. So yeah. I I thought, I was like, oh, okay, he's going to get pulled over. I was like, this is weird because he's friends with a cop. So I didn't really know what was going to happen. But then the way they set up the shot, I was like, oh, they're setting this up for the reveal to be somebody special because they mm. did not show his face yeah. for so long. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's the Terminator guy. And then he pulls out the picture and I just lost it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lost it because I I love Terminator 2 and I was like oh my god it's the Terminator <laughs> Joseph was cracking up at me yeah I enjoyed my experience of watching this movie so much yeah because that comes out of nowhere the, the film does a lot of referential stuff you've talked about mm-hmm. all the advert references but they redo the opening titles for Laverne and Shirley from they did, and it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, you have the whistling Star Trek moment. You have the Mission Impossible breaking in moment. You have the Scooby-Doo endings. Mm-hmm. Like, the film does a lot of referencing, and yet yeah, that most, not obvious, but on-the-nose reference, like actually having a character from another film doing a line from another film, mm-hmm. it's still really good when you get there. It is so good. I mean, all of it was, all of those references, like Laverne and Shirley delighted me to no end. Um, When he was whistling Star Trek 1, he whistled it very beautifully and it made me think, oh, now I know why Matthew kind of likes this movie. (laughs) And was it Wayne who said something like TNG will never be as recognizable as the original series? Yes. And I Uh, was like, oh, this just uh... got dated. (laughs) Yeah, it was nice. I liked it a lot, in case you can't tell. It was yeah, fun. Yeah, of course, when they were writing this, it was probably around season three, so we hadn't had Best of Both Worlds yet. And Best of Both Worlds is the moment that Next Generation becomes bigger and better than the original right. series. Yeah. Right. Okay, lest I take all of the good moments in this movie, will <laughs> you please tell me what you loved about it? Um. So there is something in here that I have taken into my vernacular and do use on the reg. Um, 
when you know when you're walking down the street and you're with friends and the street's a bit busy, so you end up walking in the road. Yes. When a car comes along, I will go car. <laughs> and when the car's gone past, I'll go game on. <laughs> Get back in the street. Yeah, that whole sequence. I was like, are these two 12? <laughs> Why are they playing in the street like 12 year olds? <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably the one that I've taken. And, and probably because the others are quite so popular. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I've heard you say that's what she said. Oh, yeah, but that's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as I can tell, that started with this movie. I think so. I think because I say it because it got popular again from The Office. Was it The Office that they did it a lot in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I think sense. that's what sort of repopularized it, as it were. Okay. Mm. Um, I love a fourth wall break, a turn to camera. And obviously they do this. This film knows it's a film. So that's yes. fine. But then Ed O'Neill taking the focus away from Wayne and Garth and doing this whole thing of... I'd never done a crazy thing in my life before that night. Why is it if a man kills another man in battle, it's called heroic? Yet if he kills a man in the heat of passion, it's called murder. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that moment. It's so dark and so good. Yeah, I like it when he was talking to, oh, the other guy, I can't remember his name, who had just gotten mm. laid off. And his Ed O'Neill is like, do you want to go do something about it? We can like go kill them or something. I don't remember exactly yeah. what he said, but it was pretty dark. And the other guy's like, well, I was thinking I would just file a grievance with the union. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. <laughs> God, there was so much going on in this movie. Mm. I, I like Ed O'Neill in everything. I suspect if I found out more he's probably problematic um but i remember enjoying married with children i like modern family and he's good in this too i've never not enjoyed something that he's done mm. i've also never seen modern family but from what i understand that's really good uh yeah we stopped it got very formulaic but it was still an, a nice show okay yeah Pe people were positive in it and good uh we we've talked about alice cooper and middle being great. <laughs> and as much as the ex-girlfriend is not necessarily and not not necessary and not funny and doesn't bring anything to the film, she does bring something to the film. She brings a gun rack. And <laughs> and just the Mike Myers delivery of the line. I don't even own a gun, let alone many guns that would necessitate an entire rack. <laughs> yeah. Just the the way he says a gun, let alone many guns. Yeah, I was kind of shocked that they threw out, you know, would necessitate a gun rack. I was like, yeah. wow, okay, we've got some semi-educated people here. It actually further reminded me of Bill and Ted. Mm. Because, you know, uh, Bill is like that. Yes. In in Bill and Ted, he's he's got a big vocabulary and he says very smart things. Um, And, and so I, I noticed that. And he did that on more than one occasion in this movie. Mm. But that was the first one. Yeah. It was good stuff. And it's a positive anti-gun message, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we wrap up, we did have one last comment from a friend of the show, Brandon, at Shoe Size 38. He said, Wayne is possibly the first pop culture character I wanted to be, affecting my dress, hair, and language for years. Pretty sure my dad hates him. And all I have to say to that is, Brandon, I want to see a picture of you rocking that mullet. <laughs> Yeah, the long hair is cool. I always went for a sort of Nirvana end of it, but I think that's because I had the grungy Bill and Ted thing already going on. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but I mean, like Nirvana long hair and mullet long hair are two very different things. True. Um, we we had a great comment from Josie about the, because we've not even mentioned the guitar, um, uh, but about how guitar players come to her studio to record every single one of them at some point before we finished has played the opening notes of Led Zeppelin. I stopped them as they expect me to, and they answer with no stairway denied. <laughs> yep, we did that joke when I was in a band every single time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably have to be familiar with Stairway to Heaven to get that joke. Well, no, yeah. I mean, it's it's just a, a joke about the 
like popular popularity of the song i think i mean i guess it's kind of like so um we used to do an open mic night for the sunday assembly band and where we went it was forbidden to do the song wagon wheel so i guess it's sort of like that like it's (laughs) just a song that everybody wants to do and so eventually you're just like no right yeah 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 okay yeah because the people in the store will hear it all the damn time (laughs) (laughs) yeah all right well is there anything else that we need to discuss about wayne's world um there is a wayne's world too do you want to see it i'm not sure okay honestly probably yes just because I enjoyed this one so much. Okay. But I'm afraid that because I enjoyed this one so much, the second one just can't possibly live up to it. Okay. Because I already know that it did not do well at the box office. Right. <laughs> um, see, I think I've always thought Wayne's World 2 was better. Really? And certainly, it has, it has a moment that I have quoted many, many times to many people who do not understand what I'm quoting. Um, but I still think it's one of the funniest things. It's up there with falling down the pit in Bill and Ted 2. Just okay. Just tickles me in every way I want to be tickled. Um, <laughs> but I'm now worried that it's like Airplane 2. That I used to think Airplane 2 was better than Airplane 1 because Airplane 2 has all the jokes of Airplane 1 plus some other jokes in it. Mm-hmm. But actually, no, they're funnier the first time they're delivered, not the second time. So I, I have a, a, a worry that that's actually what's going to go on there. Okay. Do we want to stick it on for the 2019 list? Yes. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's give us some space. Hmm. Okay. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. You can send us an email at podcast at eloquentgushing.com. Or you can leave us a voice message at speakpipe.com slash eloquent gushing. And you can find us both on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. Pop Godfrey Deprived is 100% funded by listeners like you through Patreon. Anything you can give, even $1 a month, gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and develop new shows. To find out more, visit patreon.com slash eloquent gushing. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest news announcements, remember to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. The link is on eloquentgushing.com. And we'll be back next week with another episode where we'll talk about Desperately Seeking Susan with Eric Malinsky from the Imaginary Worlds podcast. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, scaramouche. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.